to um, give a pitch for next week's session. On the 24th, we have legal issues for new food co-ops um, with Joel Dahlgren. And um, today's session is skills and tools for the organizing stage. Uh, Stuart Reed of the Food Co-op 500 program is presenting the session. And I'd like to introduce Stuart. Stuart. Thank you, Mark. Um, and what Mark didn't mention is that his organization is, is uh, just had a name change. The Food Co-op 500, uh, excuse me, the Cooperative Development Services Group that works directly with food co-ops is, is now a, a cooperative themselves and uh, I want to give a heads up to that. Yeah, thanks. The uh, Food Co-op 500 program, as he said, was sponsored by, by several organizations and we also received donations from some of the major uh, producers and foundations that support food co-ops. Our, our work is all done uh, at a, no charge to the organizing groups and by the generous donations of those organizations. We try to support you in any way we can through developing new resources, providing referrals, and uh, putting resources and documents on our websites and, and workspaces that you can use it, uh, without necessarily having to uh, learn from scratch and reinvent the wheel. We hope to make it easier for these all of you groups out there to, to be able to open new food co-ops more quickly and more with less effort than had to be done in the past when people didn't have that support. So we're always looking for your feedback, your advice, and your recommendation for new kinds of ways to help. And I encourage you to provide that as we uh, either during or after the presentation as we ask questions and, and go forward. Um, I would like to introduce, uh, I have two guests with me today that are, are members uh, of cooperatives and people that have had lead roles in forming new cooperatives. Uh, Barrett Griffith, a great friend of mine who works here in uh, the Northfield area. Uh, she is one of the founders of the Just Food Co-op and uh, continues to provide her background experience, expertise, and, and uh, just good thoughts to other stores starting up. And Melissa Fry, who may or may not yet be on the call, but who is joining us uh, from the company. I'm here. Oh, hi, Melissa. Great. She is <laughs> working right now with the company shops in, in co-op in Burlington and has also worked at the Chatham Marketplace in Pittsburgh, North Carolina, opening that new store relatively recently. So we have uh, some background experience here to shed some additional light on my comments. Hey Stuart, this might be uh, uh, just a time to advertise again the uh, method of audience participation that we'll be using, which is the go to webinar question and answer interface. So if you, uh, we encourage your, your questions and comments during the session and we need to uh, expand out the question and answer part of the GoToWebinar toolbar and then you type in underneath enter a question for staff and submit and that comes to me and we'll be managing that question and comment queue during the session. Back to you, Stuart. All right. I think we're ready to go. So without further ado, if uh, my clicking on my screen works, there we go. Um, this is the back. These slides are all available on the uh, at the same page where you registered for the webinar. So don't feel like you need to write down anything that you're seeing. You can uh, download those uh, that material later. Uh, but just so you know that uh, there is uh, access to the material and uh, some rec links to various sites that uh, you might find helpful. I'm going to do a brief review of our development model because it's so central to all of the work that Food Co-op 500 does. This was developed, created by members of the Cooperative Development Services Group uh, several years ago and uh, is, is the foundation, if you will, of, of all we do and all we, how we build our program of advice, recommendations, and, and everything else. It's, we call it the four cornerstones in three stages. And I've got today, what we're going to be talking about is the organizing stage, which is the first one. 
uh, and we will talk about the four cornerstones and how those can be need to be addressed as you work through that first stage. First of the cornerstones is vision, and you will have if you those of you who attended the first webinar, Bill Gessner provided slightly different definitions, and that's fine. I think there are multiple ways that you can look at it. I'm going to talk about it from the perspective that I have, having worked with co-ops that are, are getting off on the ground floor. And vision, I think, is perhaps, although all the cornerstones are, are potentially equally important, you can't build an out-of-balance building after all, I think that vision is critical in a lot of ways to the future success of an organizing group. You have to have a consistent vision of what you're doing in order to work together well. It's also an important message that you share with your community, and it's what holds you together. A project like this is going to take at least two years. Uh, very rarely it's possible to open a co-op in less time. More frequently it takes much longer. The second cornerstone is talent. And those are the people, both within the organizing group and that you bring in to help you, that will make this thing happen. These have to be the people with a shared vision. I mean, these, these cornerstones overlap, certainly. And if your group of talented people can be, uh, well, I don't know a good metaphor, but they can be incredibly talented people with all kinds of great ideas and skills, but if they don't share the same vision, they're going to be working at cross odds. And that isn't going to help anybody. So it is important that your working group comes to a consensus on what your vision is and, and shares that. There's also going to be a lot of help coming from other people in your community. Some of that, essentially almost all of the work done before the store opens is done by volunteers. And Barrett, how many hours did we estimate it took in volunteer time to open Just Food? Oh, at least 15,000, I suppose. Yeah. 20. We don't want to that was a rough estimate. We don't want to scare anybody away, but you need to be realistic. This is a big job. It is not uh, you know, a weekend hobby. There's a lot of time and energy that has to go into opening a new store. There are many stores that have benefited tremendously from local uh, professionals, either providing legal services or uh, drafting, uh, you name it, uh, marketing, lots of things that can come from that. And most co-ops, in fact, the ones that do the best use professional consultants. It's an added cost. We'll talk about that later. But using people that know what they're doing and uh, do it for a living that are doing it on a volunteer basis, uh, you know, for a specific project can be a, a tremendous way to save time and eventually actually money. Money is the next one, capital. You have to raise a lot of money to, to open a business. And originally, the first contributions come usually from the organizing team, and they may be just smaller dollar amounts and, and their time and energy to be able to put together some publicity, organize some community meetings and whatever. Fundraising starts happening to bring in money from the outside community beyond the initial group. And in some cases, you may be fortunate to be able to bring in grants. I put the question mark there very intentionally. A lot of new organizing groups feel that they're going to be able to raise a lot of money through grants. And that just isn't the case in most for most stores for a very simple reason. You're, you're opening a new retail business you're not opening a charity. And almost all grant money is funded by organizations that direct it into charitable organizations. Co-op is not a charitable organization, no matter how much good they do in the community. They are a for-profit business. And that little roadblock makes a big difference. There may be community development grants on the other hand. That's a different matter. Member equity is a huge part of the capital that you will have to raise to open a store. In the current financial crisis and lending environment, it's becoming harder and harder for, to get commercial loans of any kind, um, and co-ops are not a typical business. 
so you may have additional barriers in working with lenders. Member equity, we usually recommend that it be at least 40 to 50 percent of your total uh, money raised to open your business. And it, you're certainly better off if it can be higher. Again, there are some communities that have loan and grant programs for developing businesses or uh, renovation of neighborhoods, different, lots of different kinds of programs in different areas. Um, in, in rural development, grants are available in rural areas. Uh, but, so there, you have to look at your own situation and get your eyes and ears out there, talk to people to find out what might be available on a local level. The next cornerstone is system. And the systems refers to all of the all of the things you have to put together to you know for the business structure. And, and number one is incorporation. We recommend you do it early uh, so that you have a formal identity and you have a little bit of legal protection. You need to put together financial systems, of course, because you're going to be bringing in money and you need to be accountable to, for the people that are giving you that money. Very important that you start planning effectively early on. Uh, a development plan that outlines where you're going, when you're, and, and what kind of a time frame that you expect to be able to accomplish that in. Keeping track of information. Uh, membership information is essential. You have to have, uh, not only do you have to have it for legal reasons, but you also need those, those members' names, addresses, and contact information so that you can provide follow-up communication to them. Let them know how the project is going. Let them know when you're ready to start working for member loans, uh, when you need help, when you need specific skills that may be available in the community. Uh, a good, high-quality database uh, is, is an essential element that you really need to work on. Board structure. Uh, Mark is one of the people that does training specifically on this, and there, are, uh, there is a whole program that the Co-op Development Services has for training boards. It's never too early to start, but it's really important, even if you don't do formal training early on, that you have a structure, that you understand how your board is going to work and how it's accountable. Most organizing groups also use committees to break down that work into manageable subsections, and we'll talk more about that later. Accountability. I can't overemphasize that. Within a group you have volunteers, there is no accountability like you would see in a normal business environment where you have a manager who's responsible for the overall business who can hold people accountable in part by uh, threatening their livelihood, uh, frankly. Uh, in a volunteer group, it can be very uncomfortable, in fact, to hold people accountable, but it's essential. You've got, you're trying to start a business, you're going to be working together for a couple of years, you're going to be using people that are coming and going out of the group, and if you don't know who's doing what and you're not making sure that things that are promised are done, you will founder. It'll take forever. Within that board structure comes board policy. It may or may not be a totally different idea, but it's really, again, important that your board has clearly stated policies of what they expect and how they will work. All right, those were the, those are the cornerstones. I'm not going to go through all four or all three. I, yeah, we, we, we have three stages. We've been more and more been realizing that Many of these stages can be broken down into sub-stages uh, and even probably are, are easier to think of in sub-stages, but we have three. The organizing stage is the only one we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to be talking about the specific kinds of skills and tools that you need in that first stage of the organizing. During that organizing stage, these are some of the tasks that you're going to be dealing with. You're going to need community meetings. You're going to need to be organizing people, forming a steering committee, the group that will eventually may merge into a board, may not, but it, it's people that are going to be organizing the work at the earliest stages. You're going to be needing people that can do communications work for you to get the word out, to, to communicate to the community, and to, and 
more importantly, even perhaps than speaking, is listening, you're going to need an additional budget. Even just for the early organizing, there are a lot of costs. Uh, running some advertisements, printing some posters, having some community meetings, bringing in food, uh, perhaps consulting a little bit early on to get a head start on your organizing timeline development, a good investment that I recommend. Preliminary feasibility assessment. It's not the same as a market study. A market study is, is a very expensive and very formal, professionally done study. But preliminary feasibility takes a look at what your conditions are within your community and whether or not it makes sense to try to open a co-op. Again, we'll talk a little more about that. Community surveys are a great tool to use at this stage. They do two things. One, they act as a form of public relations and outreach by letting people know that you are there, that you're asking for their opinions. And I think the questions on the survey frequently imply the, the vision and direction that the co-op may be wanting to go. So it acts, obviously you're getting some feedback from your community as well, but that other aspect of a community survey, getting people thinking about the co-op may be more important than the results you get from it. It's very difficult to do a really statistically valid survey. Basic research, and that, can, that includes everything from who are some potential suppliers, what is the lending environment, what is the re real estate environment, and finding mentors. Again, a very important step uh, in finding another food co-op uh, or another community organization that is willing to work with you and support your efforts can be a very big boost. All right, so those are the, those are the basic cornerstones and a basic outline of what is coming ahead in that organizing stage. Now I'm going to start talking more about the specifics. And the organizing team itself is the core group that starts this process and has to really hold it together for a period of two, three, four, um, in a worst case scenario, <laughs> up to 11 years. Um, very unusual, but it does happen. Be successful, these are the things that I find are most important. That, again, I mentioned before, shared vision. Are we all working for the same thing? Do we understand what it is that we're trying to do? What is our co-op? Why do we have a co-op? What need is it going to meet in our community that isn't currently met? These are questions that you have to ask yourself. You need strong leadership, somebody that can keep a group of volunteers who may have other commitments and limited time working, moving forward without losing focus and without uh, and, and holding them accountable. Strong leadership doesn't always come at the beginning of your of, of your uh, project. It may be that that leader shows up after you've gone partway down that road or evolves out of the group from somebody that you didn't think was going to be your leader. But that leadership, whether it's one person or multiple people, really is important to keeping a project on track. And I think that already speaks to the commitment that is necessary. Again, as Barrett mentioned, tens of thousands of hours may be necessary uh, to for people to put in, and clearly that is a lot of commitment. Uh, and most of the people that are doing that are also sacrificing other things in order to be able to make that commitment. Time is part of that. Structure and accountability within the organizing team. Again, I, I can't overemphasize this. Having, knowing what you expect of each other and having some form of system, procedures, and policies that hold people accountable for what they say they will do, uh, which doesn't mean that people can't occasionally fall flat. It does mean that when that happens, you are prepared to step in and provide them with the resources or the support they need to be able to complete what they've uh, started or, or have somebody else take on that responsibility. 
any group needs honesty and respect to be effective. And that can mean everything from uh, being willing to stand up and say, I don't agree with what the group's doing, even when that's an unpopular voice, uh, or to, to stand back and say, yes, I don't agree with it, but the group has made an informed decision and I can respect that and stand behind it. And again, accountability, which I, I continue to mention, but it, it, uh, in order to be effective and to move forward on a good, solid timeline without falling way behind, maintaining some form of accountability is critical. There are different ways of structuring this work. And there's lots of different names for them. So when I use a name for a founding team or a work group or a core team or whatever it is, translate it into what you're using. It doesn't matter. The names aren't that important. But the founding team, when I talk about that, I'm talking about the group of people that first start meeting, organizing, and kicking the ball to get it started. If they may not be a board of directors. In fact, they probably aren't. At least to begin with, they won't be. Steering committees, core groups, different names for the same thing in most cases. Okay? The board of directors is a formal body. They, uh, there may be an interim board of directors in some organizations before you have a member meeting and a formal election. But eventually, it will be an elected body that represents the membership. And that is their primary role is as overseers of the members' interests, both short-term and long-term, but hopefully mostly long-term in terms of their, their viewpoint. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go too much into the board things. We're, we've got other workshops on that, but that's their role. Task forces are smaller groups that could be, can be formed to handle specific areas of development. And they are you know, maybe a committee, they might be called a task force, they might be called a work group, whatever. But those are usually composed of volunteers from the community that support the co-op, probably members, although they don't have to be, and usually involving board members. There are the member owners as a group and the community as a whole that will also be part of your structure in a less formal way. They have, those are people that have to, you have to remain in communication with. It's critical that that be part of, of your organizing process is to always be listening and talking to your members in your community so that they know what's happening and that they can support something. They know what they're supporting. Where, where in come communication systems big piece of the structure. And uh, again, I have a whole um, section later in the presentation on communication because I think it's so important. Um, Marilyn Schultz uh, shared this definition of accountability with me that she uses in, in working with boards. Have expectations and write them down. In other words, don't you know, it's fine to have expectations, but if nobody can remember what they are, it doesn't do you much good. So document them. Sign responsibility and know whose responsibility it is. It isn't the whole board's responsibility, but somebody on the board is taking the lead on it. And check. Check back to see if things are being done. Check to, to see how well we've accomplished our goals and use that in a continuous loop to replan and create new, new uh, assignments. All structures need a certain amount of stability. If your board, complete board, turns over every three months, it's going to be very difficult to, to make any progress as people are unaware of what happened before. They, there's no history. There's no, there's no momentum. That's unusual. I don't. I haven't ever seen that happen, frankly. But there can be. There will be change. You will lose some members. They will move. They will have changes of uh, interest. They will have changes in their work schedule. Whatever. The same people will not be with you from the beginning to the end. So be prepared for that. But also be prepared to integrate 
those newcomers into the group and, and fill them in and get them on track as soon as you can. I have a little graphic here, which is simplistic, but it sort of is a, a way I see how this stage of the organizing happens. The, uh, the red lines are, are, are intended, the red arrows, I should say, are intended to, to show the uh, oversight role. The members, member owners, are responsible for electing and overseeing the work of the board of directors. The board of directors is responsible for creating and overseeing the work of whether you call it founding team or work groups or, or whatever. But the, the, the smaller groups, committees that do the hands-on work on a lot of the projects. The blue lines show communication links. And clearly there's got to be an ongoing communication back and forth among all those groups. Most essential is that the board and the community are always talking about what is happening, what the plans are, what has the successes are, what the obstacles are. Let us know, make sure that the community is aware of what's happening and that they're not taken off guard. That, that can be a real downer when all of a sudden major changes happen and nobody knows what's happening. The member owners and the board need to be in constant communication so that the members and the board both know what the expectations are of each other. And the board, because they are responsible for the organization, both legally and in, on a, in a real time basis, need to be aware of what all of the individual working groups are doing, what their successes are, what their, uh, how they're making progress, whether they need more resources, whatever the case may be. Okay? So, to make that happen, and again, this is simplistic and it may not be exactly like this, please take a note that what these names I've put in the founding team are just for example. They may not be the kinds of work groups you need or that any, any co-op would need. You may need eight different ones instead of four, and they may have different names, but it's just as an example for how it aligns. But within the board of directors, there's going to be at least one member of the board who is working with each of these teams in order to provide the linkage that's necessary for the board to know what's happening and for the team to know that they have the support of the board and can get the resources and advice they need in a timely manner. That's my recommendation. There are other ways of doing it. But this, we found that this kind of a structure is very effective. Now I want to take a, a little break right here for questions and um, also for any comments from um, both Barrett and Melissa about how they have structured the groups they've worked with and how that has worked. Thanks, Stuart. Um, do you want to go first to Barrett and, and Melissa? Yeah, so let's, uh, if they have a, you know, we don't have a, a whole lot of time for discussion, but if you could give us some, just some insights into how you've organized and what you found effective. This is Barrett. I'd be glad to offer some things. We began with a meeting at the public library, and um, out of that decided to do two evening sessions of planning, which created our first plan which was to, and we were developing task forces, and our first one, our, our first workshop was done on around the question, what actions do we need to take to open co-op planning to the public at a co-op launch meeting? And this was about five months out. And so we worked toward that community meeting, which was a huge meeting, and that drew in a lot more people to help us m move forward. And we had out of that, um, I think it was six task forces and because we were already beginning to, as we were planning this meeting, looking into doing research on product and markets and a business plan and finances and capital and facility location. We were also looking into regulations at that time, set a group of people out to do field trips to other co-ops and then a whole section on networking, one on community vi visibility and then one on education. Um, articles for the papers and that kind of thing. And then after we had that community meeting, 
we had another, uh, we began to coalesce the team. We started out with what we called steering committees. But then after that public meeting, we decided we did a task force reconfiguration and a much more detailed plan for what we needed to do and began to call ourselves the founding team. And um, we were doing all this before we incorporated. We didn't incorporate until I think it was month 13. Um, and we had probably eight to ten people who were the people we called the core team and they coordinated the task forces. And we ended up with six task forces that kept us uh, going until Stuart arrived. And we had member services, community relations and outreach, legal and financial, capital funding, sources and suppliers, and store operations. And it just turned out that those people who were coordinating those task forces also became five or six of the members of the board. And then there were other people on the board when the board developed. And then we began to differentiate between the role of the people when we were in board mode, what happened, when we were in founding team mode, what happened, um, and did some writing around that so that we knew what we were doing. But immediately after this big community meeting where we got a lot of input, we began preparing for our feasibility study, which we actually did ourselves. Um, we had a one woman on our team who'd been the acquisitions librarian for the Library of Congress, and she had done a ton of feasibility studies. So we divided into three task forces for market operational and financial and went to work. And a lot of people already had writing experience and all kinds of experience. One of the gifts of Northfield is there are a lot of people with, I, I think any community is this way, but just tremendous experience. Then in, on month 11, we presented the feasibility study to the public in a big public meeting. And it was a watershed event because we felt we needed the affirmation of the community to go ahead. And at that point, we were going to need real heavy-duty commitments from people to stay with this uh, and see it through to the end. And at that time, I think, and Stuart mentioned this, where there were quite a few people on the team who were the real visionaries for this, who had been talking about it for several years, actually, before we had this meeting at the library. And it's, then the team shifted, and, and they weren't as involved. They continued to be involved, but not in uh, dealing so much with the actions that had to happen. And we did several things. We um, really looked at our own operating guidelines, you know, how we wanted to work together, what kind of communication we wanted to have, how we wanted to report and debrief and do accountability and all those kinds of things. And at this time, we were, we were working basically in all, I mean, I could basically talk forever, but they, we worked in the four categories of vision, talent, capital, and system, which weren't invented yet. But I went through afterwards and kind of divvied up what we did, and that's definitely the way we were working in retrospect. And we did, um, anyway, this is on the organizing part, but there's others on some of the funding and stuff like that, if you'd like me to do that, Stuart. I don't know how much you'd like. I yeah, mean, I've got not on this you know. on this call, I guess, but yeah, yeah. I do want to. Um, we did, yes. Uh, the the organizing, and we had regular meetings, and we did real real tight planning meetings, and we had a calendar, and we had a calendar of actions for every single one of the task forces. We had assignments for everybody, and. We never had problem with accountability because people were very excited about this and they wanted to get it going. And I think a key for us was our, our actual meeting structure where we basically, I played the role of gathering information and getting it back out to people. So we would go to a meeting and everybody would have the same information and would know where we were at. So we would, would be able to just go right into our meetings. We didn't do any other reporting unless it was something that wasn't already covered. But we would always make a list of which decision, decisions we needed to make and what is priority of those decisions. Then we would discuss critical issues with the most important first and then see where anybody needed help. And we worked in cross teams if people needed help. And um, the task forces themselves each had a coordinator. And they frequently met outside these other meetings, and it just really hummed along very well. Uh, and people, we, we decided to call it the founding team because we wanted to communicate open membership. 
and felt that steering committee felt more close to us. And we welcomed anybody to any meeting to do any amount of work for any amount of time. And some people just did short pieces and made huge contributions. Other people hung around for months. And so it was, it was just really fantastic. We I want to make a couple of quick comments about things that you said there. Just for people that aren't familiar with um, my background, I was the, when she referred to me coming on at Just Food, I was the right. general manager at the, at the Just Food Co-op, uh, and uh, so I had the pleasure of working directly with Barrett there. And the second thing is that she mentioned that they didn't incorporate until about month 13. And in the past, we haven't, we generally have not, as, as consultants and advisors, um, had made a recommendation for early incorporation, but we are doing that now. And uh, if you take a look at our legal primer that's available on our website, um, there are some explanations for why that is, but I won't go into it in depth now. Well, well I was thinking that that would be one thing I would comment on, um, store, like, like Barrett, because we came shortly on your, your heels there with my first project. Um, at Chatham Marketplace, we didn't have the benefit of this model either. But as it turns out, in retrospect, we we, we did um, follow it um, to a large degree, and so it does um, seem like a really sound sound model to me. And now, in my second project, we are more um, you know deliberately able to you know look at it and check our actions against it. And so it's definitely very useful, but in, in both of my projects, um, we did incur incorporate very early on. Um, the only thing that had been done prior to incorporation really is kind of the uh, visioning, pulling together of some core people, the writing of the business plan. Um, and then in North Carolina, you have to be able to name five board members in order to um, to incorporate and, and submit your articles of incorporation. So it was just kind of a, a necessary thing that we had to do because in both situations, the first kind of big event we had was um, kind of just a, a social gathering and an informational meeting where we wanted to be able to sell ownership shares in the co-op and we wanted folks to be able to write a check to the name of the co-op and then deposit that into a business checking account and all of that just requires incorporation. Um, so that was the, the path that we had followed. Um, and we also did, you know, many of the same kinds of things organizationally that Barrett said in, in this model reflects with the, the subcommittees and, and the accountability and all that. And I'm also just a really big advocate of early on having a single person. Um, you need this core group, whether you call it a board or the steering committee or founding team. You, you need a, a multiple people that have got a lot of time and energy to commit, but I feel really strongly that you need one person, whether they call themselves project manager or, or team leader or, or whatever, but it, it, it really, I think, requires um, a sole person to kind of keep everybody um, on task and just organized and spearheading and um, especially as you start to get into like media relations and things like that to have that one voice for, the, for them coming from a single person. Um, so I, I just think that if you can get a volunteer to do that up front, that's great. That was the role that I played in the first year and a half of organizing for Chatham Marketplace. I just was, I just was able to volunteer that much time. Um, it's essentially a part-time job, I'd say 20, 24 hours a week for whoever's going to take that on. And, um, and then in my second project, it, that was able to be a paid position from the get-go because some of the initial board members were actually willing to put up significant sums of money to support that position from the get-go. So it can, it can go either way, but I, I think um, it, it does need to be a single person. That's a great I want to second what Melissa said, too, because I did play that role here, too, and I, I agree with you totally. There does need to be somebody who can kind of watch over the whole works and initiate communication and coordinate it. Yeah. Right. I would say that I, I third that, but um, all too often there isn't a person who has the time, energy, and skills to donate that. And mm -hmm. we're increasingly uh, – trying to recommend to groups that they can seriously consider hiring a, a part-time project manager as soon as they possibly can. It makes mm -hmm. it 
it, it helps to keep the project moving in ways that you uh, are almost, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't even consider it if you didn't see it. But uh, again, we'll talk later about what you get for the money you spend. And a lot of times uh, I see too many groups that are penny wise and found foolish that are just afraid to spend any money on outside help when the truth of the matter is that it would make their project uh, happen in half the time and probably at half the cost. So thank you. Um, Mark, how, how are our question log? Uh, do we well, have? We certainly have, we certainly have some. A, a, a couple, but I, then I need to get back on the presentation, I think. Okay, great. Um, I see you have several several uh, questions here on the uh, under the kind of header of talent. Um, one person is uh, writing in and asking about best advice for helping the volunteer group stay sticky. Um, they've had some situations where volunteers will offer to take charge of an important task and then um, and then quit the group and. You know that has a big, big cost to the to the progress. So, any any um, any tips for for that listener? I'm going to pass that one on to uh, the front line people on here. Well, this is Barrett. One of the things that we did, we met every other week at least, and um, frequently we met. There was a, a core group at that time of probably eight to ten people, and we frequently met in somebody's home and everybody brought food and we we became friends. We None of us really knew each other before this and we became friends and began to develop relationships with each other just as people and I think that helped with the commitment and it helped with people feel that they were really responsible for completing the things that they'd taken on. I mean that's not a, a complete answer to that but I think it did play a big role and that the people were really cared about each other and cared about the project also. Yeah, I would I would second that making um you know, making connections with folks and building relationships and so there's a, a natural accountability that comes when when you do that. Um, you know, the other thing is it's just be very wise where you put your assignments. We we tended early on and continue to to act this way is that the really kind of critical things and, and things that require more responsibility are basically going to be spearheaded by a board member and then they may be assisted by volunteers that are not board members but that you kind of um, keep tabs on all your various committees by having a board member or steering committee member on all of those committees and that tends to help with accountability and then if you lose a key person in that committee for whatever circumstance you you've still got a board member in there that's in the know knows, knows what's going on and could you know perhaps pick up the pieces a little bit um, easier that way and then um, I, I learned this from some uh, folks on my initial board at Chatham Marketplace and, and it's just very um, logical but uh, I, I didn't do it as enough as I should have initially and is that you just have to be so thankful <laughs> for all of your vo volunteers and really put um, time and, and money and effort into showing them how thankful you are that they are donating their time and whether it's just a special note or email or uh, you know a bottle of wine or you know just whatever a, a little note um, just showing appreciation um, constantly to volunteers goes a really long way. Yeah, I agree with that totally. And I also, one of the things we did is we asked people what they wanted to do. We were always very clear about what the plan is and what needed to be done so that everybody was pretty much doing something they wanted to be doing and had passion for and interest in. I have hey. another uh, talent, talent question kind of on the other side of the spectrum of having uh, volunteers who are uh, committed and, and involved, but um, but not being effective and not being able to let go of the project in a way to help it move forward. You know, and any advice on on, uh, on helping someone see that it's it's uh, it's time to let others step in or have others do some work. Well, with us, when we would meet, and we would always ask where people needed help. For one thing, we had a chart 
that everybody had of everybody's name on it and what everybody was working on. And so we met often enough so that we were able to monitor where we were at and someone would step in say to, if something wasn't going well, someone would just step in and help that, that person and then sometimes sort of a transfer of responsibility would happen. But I think it's also key that we did have someone who was coordinating each of the task forces that did exactly what Melissa is saying is watch over it and be able to step in when necessary. Yeah. Nice. Um, and just uh, for those of you who joined the session after we made our last tutorial on how to ask questions, we're using the written interface on the uh, GoToWebinar uh, toolbar. Look forward to your questions. One other talent issue or, or, or comment that came up was, is there a correlation between how many members you have uh, in the co-op and in order to draw on people to establish as your core group? Is there a correlation there? Well, we didn't have any members when we started. So I mean, we awesome. just had a group of people. And then we began to, after we um, uh, incorporated, then we, we sold memberships to everybody who had been a part of the group. And then it just kept growing. And we would be at every festival in town. I mean, we would be selling memberships everywhere we, everywhere we could. And so we worked with the team. Our team worked for quite a few months before we had any real members because, of course, we couldn't sell memberships until we incorporated. Yeah, you need, you need that core group before mm -hmm. you have any members or owners. Mm -hmm. I would add that I've seen organizing groups recently that had a very strong core group uh, and had a very, that was almost all there was in the organization. Um, at, at the very earliest stages, obviously that can't be sustainable, but it is possible to get an organizing group together. And, I, and you do have to have some kind of a group together to start bringing in people and communicating and, and organizing meetings. I mean, it, it, it's just mm -hmm. an essential step. And that's true. If I could just uh, have one more question uh, submitted here. Um, there are a couple others that we'll hold for later. This is a question about um, spending money as you go uh, regarding um, spending money on, on events, for example, that the event might be to raise money um, and they're trying to sell shares and should they be spending money you know, for an event? Um, yeah, I'll take that one. Um, the, our recommendation is that money that comes in from membership shares, member equity, donations, or any of the early fundraising is all money that you use as you get it. You need that money to, to, to carry on your efforts, and it doesn't make sense to set it aside in escrow. Uh, otherwise, how are you going to make any progress at all? The members should understand that. People that invest the money should understand that. We're going to make the best use we can of your money, but we are going to spend it in order to try to open a business. That's why we got the money from you. However, when it comes that, to starting to raise member loans, then there's a distinction. Those are often held until a final decision is made that we are going to open a store, that we've made all the we have our financial commitments and we have our, our site and, and everything is in place before we will start uh, using member loan commitments. So that, that would be the distinction. But I would say yes, you, you do have to spend membership equity and any other fundraising you do early on, or you won't have any way to proceed. Right. And I, I agree with Store. I would just add that that um, share money that you do have to use some of initially to keep the project moving forward just needs to be spent um, as frugally as possible. So you'll, you'll, you know, you may have people on your team that are graphic designers or marketers, and, and, and of course there's all kinds of wonderful ideas that can be pursued early on, um, but if you have, you know, just to be very concrete, if, if you're going to do a brochure, which I would highly advise to do a trifold brochure with an ownership application in it to help spread the word around the community, um, you know, you can go all out on that. It can be glossy, it can be color, or you can do it on, you know, uh, thinner paper, black and white, that kind of thing. And I would always just recommend doing the more frugal thing early on because money becomes so tight when you actually start having your your hard costs of upfit and um, you know hiring people and 
things like that that I have found that um, I've, I've, I've never regretted being as frugal as I possibly could during the initial startup phase. Mm -hmm. yep. We had, we developed a team budget like within the second month of meeting and it was just very frugal and we tried to get as much as we could in kind like when we did a public meeting we would say give fifty dollars to the church which had a huge hall and things mm -hmm. like that and had people bring things and got in kind work on designing a brochure and right. I, I mean we just did a lot to we we just watched it very very carefully. It goes back to my earlier point about one of the one of the key steps is to develop your your initial budget and and that by having a budget it helps you control those expenses. Stuart, I, I, I have several questions on on spending money. Do you want those now or later? I, I think we're going to have to hold off on questions for a little bit so that we can get through the at least hopefully most of the presentation. Um, you don't mind, I'll, and please also note that people that ask questions that we can't cover during the presentation, we will try to provide answers later. Uh, so it, it isn't. Uh, in All right, moving on then. Um, so during now, I'm going to go back to some of those key points that I mentioned earlier and talk about specifics um, during the organizing stage, keeping good records and documentation. It's a, you need to start this early on, and because you are forming a business, you know, and you do have legal responsibilities. The, the legal responsibilities are largely included in the board minutes, and those can be fairly concise. Board minutes are not intended to document discussions; they're documented of decisions that are made and uh, motions that are passed. Things, things that are formally accomplished during the meeting are what need to be documented in board minutes. Uh, that's a, that can be a long discussion. There's lots of other resources on how to do proper board minutes, so I can't really take the time to go into it in depth. But uh, as a board or decision-making body, whether you're pre, if you're pre-board, you at least need to document what decisions are made, who is responsible for them, and when you expect to see a result. Any policy decisions that you make, record them. Don't just make them and forget them. It's so easy to go back a year later and say, well, I thought we said, and nobody remembers and nobody has a record. Policy manuals um, are easy to create in a ring binder, and whenever anything is added or changed, it can be popped in or popped out. It's not terribly difficult. It just takes organization. Essential membership data. You know, again, we talked about that earlier, but it is just essential. Make sure you have a good system for maintaining membership data and financial records. You are probably not going to be incurring any kind of tax liability during your early organizing stages or anything like that. But you do need to keep good records of any membership income that comes in because that becomes part of your permanent record. And you do have to have records just to document your fiscal responsibility of the money that comes in and goes out on, on all of your expenses. And it all, you might not think of it right away, but someday you're going to really wish you had good historical records of what it was like opening a co-op. And people will want that. So think about that early on. And, and having a group historian, somebody that just wants to keep track of that kind of stuff, could be a real asset. Good volunteer opportunity. Communication systems, critical to maintaining that accountability and shared knowledge base that your working groups, founding team, and your board all use to make sure that, the, that you're getting a job done. And there are a lot of different systems that have been effective, but you know, almost every group that I currently work with is using email extensively. It, it, even a few years ago, there were a lot of people that still were uncomfortable, but now I can't imagine that you wouldn't use that for communicating uh, with each other. Another system that we're using or seeing used a lot are web-based groups like a Yahoo group or, or whatever, whatever one you choose to use, a lot of them are at no cost, but it allows for a, a group um, interface along the people that are organizing to share information, documents, and schedules. 
And the next step from that would be a workspace, which uh, and, and this I have found that most people aren't as familiar with unless they're more advanced in using technology. But we use them in uh, Food Co-op 500 and uh, Cooperative Development Services uses them. They are a basically a, a virtual office space that you can sign up for at relatively low cost. And that space can be used to keep a group calendar, to upload and download documents, to have discussions, and, and numerous other things. The, uh, if people on this call are interested in that, you can certainly talk to me about uh, some of the options that are out there and how effective they could be for a group organizing effort. I think they're a great opportunity to, to uh, keep all your information in one place where everybody has access and can, and can get to it. Um, newsletters. Not your your members, as you sign them up, and your community are going to want to know what's happening. And it is essential that you tell them, or they will lose faith. So no matter whether you feel like there isn't a whole lot to report, I, I do highly recommend that you find some way to make regular reports. And it could be by um, internet-based sendings, or it could be hard copies. Leaving some in public places where people can pick them up is, is a good idea. And of course, you've got the, the, your general outreach or, and advertising efforts, which uh, are basically intended to bring the word to people that have not yet heard. And I, um, there's a lot of resources for doing that. Um, in fact, there is a webinar being hosted by the National Club Business Association, uh, the link is on our website on the events tab for that webinar, and it's specifically on marketing. And I, I, I know the person who's presenting it. I've, I've read his book and talked to him. I highly recommend it. You know, other aspects of communication include the expectations you have. And this is for mostly for the organizing group, but it also talks in terms of how often you're going to talk to your community and your owners. How often do you do that? I mean, how often are you going to meet? Is once a month enough? I don't think it is. I mean, Barrett spoke to the fact that they met at least every other week. I think during some aspects of a project, your teams might be meeting as much as weekly, or at least some people will. It comes, again, back to that whole concept of time commitment and uh, you know the people that can lead. You need to be good at, at, at telling people what you want to say. I mean, yeah. The right amount of detail and clarity, not an 80-page report to tell somebody that you found two sites in town that might be available. Um, you know, it, it, People's time is at a premium, so be, be brief and be efficient. And of course, with communication, honesty and respect, which I mentioned earlier in terms of how important it is in your structure, you have to be able to talk openly. You have to be able to share concerns openly. And you have to be able to hear other people's issues without becoming defensive. There are, I'm gonna, I was going to take some comments there, but I think we're running a little behind the schedule I was hoping to be on. So I'm going to skip to the, uh, a couple more slides here, and then we'll take some comments and questions. There are a lot of tools that you can use yourself. This is the tools part of this presentation now. And I say that's one of the major uh, goals of the Food Co-op 500 organization is to provide as many of these self-help tools as we can, knowing that we can't possibly work with the 100 or so organizations around the country face to face. So we have been putting together a lot of things. We did not do this. The How to Start a Food Co-op book, most of you have I probably are familiar with, was done by Karen Zimbelman with help from other people and has been out for quite a while. It isn't completely in alignment with what we currently recommend, but it's still a great resource for starting out. That's me. Um, there's only one of me, and I'm always here to answer questions by email or phone and to give advice when I can. If I can't, I will try to find somebody that can help you. We have a ton of material on our website, and there's always more being added. So if you haven't been there, or if you haven't really checked out all of the sections on it, I highly recommend that. 
I talked about workspaces in the communications slide, and we have one uh, that we use for the purposes I mentioned. We have a document library there. We have a resource database of links to other websites, and there's an opportunity for, for users to blog there. So if you're interested in that, by all means, uh, we hope you would sign on. Or I'll have a sign on uh, link on this uh, future slide. <clears throat> These webinars. Not just to mention that you're here today, obviously you know about them, but we have, uh, as Mark mentioned, this is a series of 12, and they're roughly arranged chronologically through the development process. So as we go through them, we'll be getting into later stages of development, and we hope you can come to them. We also have an archive on the, at the same place where you registered of past presentations, and as these are done, they will all be added to that so that you can uh, download and review a presentation if you can't be there live. Tremendous opportunity for keeping involved in what's happening in the co-op world, and a lot of the material is actually very relevant for startup groups, is the Cooperative Grocer Magazine. The Co-op Grocers Information Network, CGIN as it's affectionately known, provide, as also has a library of documents and several other things, so I'll, I'll come back to them and Co-op Metrics, which is a uh, database of financial performance that has been maintained for quite a few years now that has, will give you more information about financial performance of food co-ops than you can possibly imagine. It is a subscription resource, but they will offer access for a year free for new stores. And of course, the National Cooperative Grocers Association, which is a membership organization, primarily supporting member stores but they also support our work and can provide some resources. And almost off the bottom of the screen, but just as important are your peers. Don't be afraid. In fact, don't hesitate at all to talk to established stores, not necessarily even regionally, but stores that have similar characteristics to the one you're envisioning. They can give you a wealth of information and advice and uh, most co-ops that I've ever worked with are happy to do that. A few more. We have on the website predominantly uh, all of our tools, and there are a lot of them that you can use, and everything from uh, a template for your sources and uses budget to our legal primer and uh, information on how to do member surveys. There will be lots more still coming. Uh, the best practice is the membership and marketing document, which is a tremendous asset. It was built by on the front lines membership and marketing professionals from co-ops with recommendations for best practices, as it says, on how to set up a membership program, how to market your co-op. Stephen Van Yoder is the person presenting that webinar I mentioned that NCBA is doing on marketing. He has a book out called Get Slightly Famous. Um, I've read through it and was very, very impressed with the quality and quantity of information he provides on how to get your name out in the market. It's the Get Slightly Famous concept was perhaps originally designed for individuals who wanted their name to be synonymous with quality in the work they did. But it worked in what he has in there is equally as useful for an organization like a new founding, a new co-op getting started and how they can get their name out and become a recognized entity in their community. So I, I think that is one of the, between the membership and marketing document and the Get Slightly Famous book, you can have a lot of good ideas on how to, to get the word out in your community. An older series of effective books is the North Country Cooperative Development Fund sponsored a series of toolbox uh, books on different topics. Now, some of the information is a little dated, but they're still valuable, and I would recommend you at least take a look at them. You can find, you can order them through the Cooperative Grocer Magazine or their website. And in order to help find other co-ops that might be in your area or just to find out more about other co-ops, you can use a co-op directory, and again, that is also on the Cooperative Grocer website. There are more than one, but that's the one I use most often. And uh, the interesting thing that you can do with that that I do recommend is that almost all co-op websites, which they list, will have in things like their bylaws, their membership uh, requirements, 
uh, information about their store, things that you can use to get a lot of ideas. So um, I'm going to go back and give these. These are more for reference than they are for discussion. But when you, if you download the slides from the resource, or, or I mean, excuse me, the registration page, you'll have the links for some of these other sources of information. And I want to take just a few minutes. We don't have too much time, but just a couple minutes here to ask if there are um, any other uh, recommendations that either Barrett or Melissa would have for the kinds of tools and resources that they found as available for self-help, specifically self-help. Well, we had every single person on the team read how to start a food co-op so that we were all on the same page, and it was really helpful. And I think our the next thing for us was when we Shortly after we incorporated, we hired, began consulting with Bill Gessner, and that was just invaluable. And we got a $13,000 grant from USDA to train the founding team, which included all Bill's work with us. And it was just invaluable. Okay, well, we'll talk about the paid help, but specifically things that you can do without um, going outside your own uh, environment. Any, any I other? would say. I would say um, doing a really good job of, of hand picking whoever there's kind of like the core and then there's the core core so in the projects I've been involved in there's maybe been two or three people that are really the kind of the, the nucleus of the initial um, vision and, and work and then you need to get bigger than that and become a formal board uh, there's just more work to be done than, the, than that number of people can do and then so you kind of get this bigger core and as you are developing that bigger um, core group you know think specifically about what skills would come in handy in doing this kind of project so you want somebody with you know strong business skills and it, it's very unlikely that it would be a, a food co-op but just business skills in general come in very handy folks that are long-term members of the community that you're trying to put this co-op up in somebody that might have um, agricultural connections, um, a lawyer, a real estate agent, a CPA. These are all the kinds of people that you want really close to you on your board and providing you pro bono services and um, things like that. Well, yeah, we had one woman who was on the early board who was also a farmer uh, and a lot of other things, and she really organized all the connections with the um, local farmers in the area and the local suppliers and mm -hmm. also organized a, uh, we had a, a farm a winter farmers market that we did where she organized getting all the farmers to come in for that event one I think we did one a month that first winter and that was fabulous in terms of getting people linked into the actual local food community she was also the link to all that we had 10 buying clubs in town she was also the link to all those buying clubs and getting them on board to have a co-op. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go work through these, uh, Mark, and uh, a few more slides. And we, I think we'll, what we'll do is uh, try to catch as many questions as we have time for at the end. Okay, great. Um, all right. So again, I'm not going to spend much time on these because I've already talked about them. But for reference, here are, is how you can access some of these tools. How to start a food co-op. You can download it for free online. You can also order a printed copy if you really want to. Um, hopefully you already have our website, but that is our address. And if you are interested in our web workspace, you can register here. Um, we do, uh, there's a couple of caveats. We, we accept admission requests from people that are working on organizing a food co-op. Uh, we have uh, some requirements for how you participate, and you can't upload documents yourself. We are controlling that because we're opening the space up to a lot of people, so that if you have information you'd like to share, uh, it does need to be uh, sent to me for approval, and then I would post it. But other than that, it, it's basically a library that we're hoping that you will help us to populate. Um, just a quick review of the other webinars here that are coming up. Um, with this, this one's done. This is today. The legal issues is being done by our attorney, Joel Dahlgren, who 
helped us write the legal primer. That's going to be a tremendously valuable webinar for anybody that has questions on legal issues. Uh, governance and accountability, going into more depth on some of the things I've talked about. Member economic participation, in other words, how do members, member equity programs and member loans and things like that, and how do members become, uh, help capitalize a co-op. Uh, sources and uses budget will be done by Bill Gessner, who is the pro on that. Um, feasibility and planning for success. Uh, now we're talking, there's two different things. You'll note that there's feasibility and market research, and I'll, I've mentioned that a lot. A basic feasibility study is something you can do yourself and, and think about yourself. Market research is a professional study, and we're talk, going to talk about both. The market research is going to be done by one of the consultants that we recommend highly for doing that. Uh, a member loan campaign specifically, there's so much information you need for that. It gets a whole webinar. How to do marketing and promotion. Project management, especially as you come closer to your construction and build out. Uh, having somebody that understands how to work with contractors and how to keep 18 balls in the air at the same time can be very valuable. And finally, uh, one of the last steps before you open, is, uh, although it hopefully will happen six to eight months before you open, is hiring a general manager. Uh, Carol Lee Coulter is an independent consultant that specializes in hiring and, and manage, uh, hiring and uh, personnel practices. We'll be doing that. So a lot to look forward to there. There is the registration uh, address, which you, if you're here, you've already found. And again, not only can you register, but you can find recordings of the previous webinars, the background reading materials, and register for a future ones. The toolbox that we have, these are materials that are primarily available on our website, although some of them that I consider to be slightly less suitable for uh, unrestricted access are only available on our workspace. And again, if you have questions about that, let me know and I'll help you to find the documents you're looking for. Our development flowchart is a massive document of about 18 legal sized pages, if you printed it, that steps you through the whole development model with every task that you need to accomplish. And of course, there will be deviations as you go, but you know this is a standard kind of development timeline. And along that timeline, there are links that you can click on to take you to documents and resources and other websites that will help you with those particular tasks. The webinars, of course, are part of our tools. We have a community presentation that you can share with people in your community or your organizing group to help explain what a co-op means for their, when it comes to town, what it will do for the community and, and for the owners. We have the legal primer, which outlines all of, uh, most of the legal considerations that the starting co-op would need to think about from um, incorporating to bylaws to member programs and member loan programs and, and beyond. And we have a, a frequently asked question document about customer surveys. That will be supplemented soon with a template for doing customer surveys, but that's not quite complete. And again, we have a link. We didn't create it, but we have a link to the best practices for membership and marketing. So all of those, all those tools are available at no charge to you. Um, Cooperative Grocer Magazine, here's a blurry looking uh, image of the way that uh, magazine comes out. And I highly recommend that it, you order that for all of your core team or your board members. There's their web address. And in addition to the magazine uh, itself, at that address, in addition to being able to subscribe to the magazine, you can also look at their archive of past articles for free. You can order the N uh, NCDF Toolbox series. You can order a hard copy of How to Start a Food Co-op. And you can review uh, a directory of co-ops that are open around the country. So there's a lot of information. The Co-op Grocers Information Network was formed by mem uh, managers of some of the co-ops in the uh, United States to share information more effectively, knowing that we had a huge amount of joint resources that weren't being uh, used as well as they could. They created an online library, uh, and that library contains, uh, at this point, I think thousands of documents that have been shared by co-ops around the country on everything from 
payroll policy to uh, job descriptions to you know whatever you can imagine. It is a subscription service. You have to pay to get on it, but it's uh, very valuable, I think, in finding information about how things can be done without having to, again, reinvent the wheel. They also sponsor some listservs uh, for different areas of interest. A general one, which is open to, for, at no charge to anyone who's interested in co-ops and has, will have questions posted about almost anything you can imagine. Also archived so you can look at past discussions. And then there are some more specific ones for membership and accounting and whatever, and some of those do have a cost if you affiliate with them. On their website, they have a lot of links to other co-op sites, and they also have uh, a regular uh, news posting that lets you know what's happening uh, in the world of co-ops. And, and if your co-op has an article that's put in to press, chances are they will let uh, the rest of the world know about it. They have an opportunity for posting job opens, which could be of interest when you get ready to hire a general manager or a project manager. That's their web address. The NCGA, National Cooperative Grocers Association, is uh, technically a business services cooperative. It's owned by the co-ops that are members. There are 110, I believe is the current number, of member co-ops representing 130, yeah, there we go, I got the numbers, 130 storefronts. And they are right now meeting in Seattle, Washington, having their annual meeting, and who knows, we'll probably have all kinds of news from that to share with you later. That, this is an organization that any news co-op should be in touch with and should try uh, their best to work with to attain membership. Um, the support that they provide and the access they provide to group contracts for services and goods are incredibly valuable. I, I have worked with that organization for many years, both on uh, in a regional group uh, leadership capacity as well as, uh, as a member co-op. And I can't think of any single thing that will better support a new store than being a member of this organization. Aside from having, you know, more money than you know what to do with, which is unlikely. Finally, my plug for paying for help. If you don't have any money, where are you going to get it? I can't answer that all the time. I can give you some suggestions, but I will tell you this. It is probably cheaper to pay for the help you need than to do it yourself and do it wrong. It will make sh it will ensure that your project is completed in a more timely manner because you will be able to move forward much more quickly than if you have to use volunteers and people that don't necessarily have professional experience in retail store, let alone in starting a retail store and a co-op, trying to figure out what they're doing. It also gives you a lot more credibility in, in the outside world. You can tell people, well, we didn't just make up these numbers. We didn't just make up these plans. We hired somebody that knows what they're doing to help us with it. There is a lot of help available. Some of it costs money, some of it doesn't. And I'm going to run through some of those key aspects of, of getting your store open and, and just to give you lists of where you can find help. Again, I'll do this fairly quickly, but the slides are there for you to download so that you can go back and reference them. For general support, I'm here to take questions. Help, happy to help you. The CDS Consulting Co-op, which is the food co-op specialist in the, in the Cooperative Development Services Group, uh, are an incredible group of talented people that have specialized in working with retail food co-ops. That's what they do. They do it all the time, and they know what they're talking about. I can't recommend them highly enough. There are other cooperative development centers. Some of them have very talented people as well. I haven't worked with them as much as I have with cooperative development services, so I will just tell you that they're out there and that you should check on them if they're in your area. And if you need help finding one that's in your area, again, talk to me. I'll be happy to help you. There are other professional consultants that work independently. I can refer you to those if you have a specific need, or you may be able to find them on your own. And in fact, some uh, stores have used uh, 
professional consultants from outside of the food co-op sector for specific kinds of help. Um, that can be problematic sometimes if they don't understand the, the realities of our market. At other times, it can work. So uh, I recommend that if you're looking at any kind of a consulting arrangement, talk to people that have used them, find out how well it worked, and uh, you know you can ask me for a referral again as well. And co-op peers, of course, we mentioned earlier, don't forget them. Doing presentations at community meetings. Um, talk to your neighboring co-ops. First choice, I would say. They can talk from their own experience. They give it a personal perspective. And a lot of times, uh, they can be very effective uh, speakers for you. Some of the co-op development centers have people that would be willing to help with this. I have a PowerPoint presentation on our website that you uh, can use. If you can download it, and it's very generic, but it talks about what the impact of a co-op is on the community, what a co-op really is, structurally, things like that. And um, I'm sure there's other. Uh, I, I was going to open this up for questions, but again, I think we're running a little short on time. Uh, not for questions, but for suggestions. So I'm going to skip that. Um, other for incorporation, we have our legal primer on the website. The upcoming webinar. You may be able to find lawyers with retail cooperative experience. There aren't very many. Um, I know of only a few in the entire country, in fact, that uh, have retail cooperative experience. There are many more that have experience working with producer co-ops. And some co-ops have had good luck working with law schools and gotten pro bono services for some kinds of legal work. That can be effective in some cases, but again, depending on how complicated your situation is that you need advice on, when you start looking at member loan programs, for example, or you know, problems of incorporating in, this, in the District of Columbia where it's not technically a state, you have uh, you need some real serious help. For financial planning, another webinar for that one coming up. We have a sources and uses budget template on our website. And again, I would recommend consultants for this. Financial planning is very complicated. And when you're talking, trying to budget for five years into the future, or project a budget for five years into the future, you need to know what you're doing. Grants. Probably not a big part of your budget. I'm going to reiterate that. But we do have uh, some references to documents that uh, list potential grantors. Within your community, you may have volunteers that were willing to help you that have had experience writing grants or know of local grant opportunities. The cooperative development centers, all of them have had some experience with grant writing and may be able to advise you on possible opportunities. And again, the professional consultants have often worked with co-ops that have either gotten grants or uh, have helped them to get grants. So they can be a, a valuable resource. Local community development money. Always check to find out if that's available through your local government. For general planning, you may be able to find volunteers that have experience doing project planning or management. Otherwise, good, uh, you can hire a consultant, or you can actually hire for the position uh, itself. We have the communities, the question and answer document on community surveys to help you understand what you need to look for in either creating your own or hiring somebody to do one. We hope to have our uh, template of a community survey out very soon so that you won't have to create your own. And of course, there's the opportunity to use professional survey companies, which will cost you considerably, but will give you um, probably easier to interpret results and more statistically valid results. For membership, we have our best practices document that I've referred to, a, we a webinar coming up, consultants that can help you extensively with that. When it gets to creating a membership program and setting up share programs, you will want to have that reviewed by a lawyer and preferably somebody with consumer co-op experience. Your peers can also be good advisors, but I put a question mark there intentionally because 
there are so many different kinds of member programs, some of which were created 20, 30 years ago and are still being used and they're really not any longer considered a best practice. So the fact that you have somebody recommending a membership program to you from an existing established co-op isn't necessarily uh, the right reason to adopt it yourself. You should be cautious about that and, and check into other options at least. It may, I'm not saying that they aren't giving you good advice, but that you should be cautious. For feasibility, not a market study, but for feasibility, determining whether a co-op can have a reasonable chance of being successful in your community, the resources would include doing a member survey, using any local expertise you can find. For this, you can use college projects, market research. They would, they would probably call it market research. We wouldn't. But to get an idea of what your potential is in the community. Talk to other local stores and producers, particularly if you have questions about whether you'll be able to get the products you want to sell. In small communities and rural communities, sometimes that can be an issue. Don't be afraid to talk to bankers early on about what their expectations are for the business accounts and business loans so that you know what you're going to be facing. Get them to understand as much as they can about your business so they're ready when you do come asking. Work with realtors, especially if you can recruit them on your board. Um, get them to you know, talk about what is available in the market, what you can expect for lease rates, things like that. Developers, perhaps more so in urban environments, but it's not common for new co-ops to work with a development project for space within that that they will lease. Um, and again, I'm going to put consultants on every single list. So those consultants, again, the DS Consulting Co-op is at the top of my list because I know them, I trust them, and I recommend them. Other regional cooperative development centers and independent consultants are all out there. Within the independents, I recommend if possible to work with co-op specialists. Other grocery industry consultants may be appropriate in some cases. And attorneys, you will absolutely need to use an attorney at some stage of the game. I recommend it for incorporation, for member loan programs, and for bylaws at the very least. And then, of course, the peers. Peers can serve many roles, mentors, advisors, supporters, and trainers. And in the early stages, it's mostly going to be in the mentors, advisors category, perhaps some support. Later on, you can use a, a lot of stores have been willing to share um, their expertise to help train your staff or be ready to open. All right, so that was the worst way of ending. I apologize. I think we've gone slightly over time. Are we there, Mark? Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Stuart. Um, uh, that was that was a full presentation, and thanks so much to uh, Barrett and Melissa for bringing in your perspectives. Um, the recording will be posted um, later today or tonight, and um, and also there will be a session evaluation form that will come up. Um, Actually, I think the way it's going to work is it will be emailed to you to the uh, email address that you use for registering for the webinar. That's how uh, today's session is set up for the evaluation. Um, Stuart, anything else in, in closing? Uh, just a thank you to Barrett and Melissa for being available today to help, and I apology for coming short on time so that I couldn't take full advantage of your expertise. Um, anybody that did have questions that um, we can respond to later, we will try to do that. Okay, and uh, tune in next week for um, legal issues for new food co-ops with Joel Dog. Thanks, thanks everyone. And Mark, will you give me a call when we're done? Sure. We'll